Hello, everybody. Nelson Virgil here with uh, ExcelMail.com and DiscountedLabs.com. I'm very honored today uh, to introduce my urologist here in Houston. I'm very privileged to have a doctor that has published more than 100 articles. Last time I Googled his name. And uh, he's one of the experts uh, in the field of uh, men's health, urology, um, testosterone replacement, um, prostatic issues. I think uh, you also treat Dr. Kara uh, female dysfunc uh, sexual dysfunction too. But hey, um, very happy to have him. He's going to give today a lecture that I think everybody's going to find uh, extremely interesting is uh, covering the controversies of testosterone therapy. So let's start, Dr. Kara. Thanks a lot. Thank, for, you. Um, for, Thank uh, you for the introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, as you mentioned, there has been significant controversies with the use of testosterone therapy over the past five years. Cardiovascular risk, DVT, uh, prostate cancer, BPH. And today I'd like to really discuss some of those controversies and give you some further insight on the diagnosis and treatment of hypogonadism. I always like to give you some of the statistics. I'm not sure if many of you know this or are aware that in 2012, testosterone was one of the fastest selling medications in the United States. There wasn't a single medication that was selling faster than testosterone. The concern was that while the testosterone sales were increasing, uh, the testing in the United States uh, during this time was also starting to decline. Uh, one interesting statistic was that roughly 27% of men who initiated testosterone did not have a, a blood test prior to taking the medication, and 21% of men who actually started testosterone didn't have a follow-up test. So clearly there was some abuse uh, with testosterone and some concerns. When I talk about controversies today, I'd like to give you three different perspectives. I'd like to give you the perspective of what the FDA label has to say, as well as what the guidelines have to say. We are very fortunate in 2018, uh, two guidelines came out. Uh, the AUA, the American Neurologic Association, uh, came out with their testosterone guidelines. At the same time, the endocrine guidelines also came out with their testosterone guidelines as well. So I'd like to share with you these three different perspectives as we go forward. The first is on the concept of venous thromboembolism or VTE. And so you should be aware that in the package insert of uh, testosterone products in 2005 in the adverse reaction section of the label, it was amended to note that one patient during the open label extension uh, trial did suffer from a DVT. Now in 2009 the, in the label, it was changed again under the new medication guide that listed blood clots in the legs among the serious side effects. So if you open the package insert uh, for testosterone products, you will see, and this is just for Androgel, uh, that they do uh, put in the section of warnings and precaution, uh, a concern for VTE, and I'll, I'll read this. Uh, there have been post-marketing reports of VTE events, including DVT, PE, and patients using testosterone products, such as Androgel in this case. Evaluate patients who report symptoms of pain, edema, warmth, and erythema in the lower extremity for DVT, and those who present with acute shortness of breath for PE. If a VTE is suspected, uh, discontinue treatment with testosterone and initiate appropriate workup and management. So this is in the package and certain you should be aware that patients uh, will read this and they will ask you about this. Now we should be very uh, careful because uh, the guidelines slightly differ. And if you look at the American Neurologic Association guidelines, it states that patients should be informed that there is no definitive evidence linking testosterone therapy to a higher instance of VTE. The endocrine guidelines uh, really don't have a guideline statement on this, but they do have some uh, the comments that they made. Uh, they do state that case control and pharmacoepidemiologic studies have not shown a consistent increase in the risk of VTE with testosterone treatment. However, there are too few uh, testosterone-associated VTE events in randomized controlled trials to draw meaningful inference. So you can see where there's three different perspectives here, and they all are slightly different in their beliefs of how uh, testosterone affects VTE. The second controversy is cardiovascular risk. Uh, and many of you may, have, may be aware with this, there was um, a significant amount of concern at one point that testosterone may cause a heart attack. So I'll put this in the context of a story. It was very interesting. Molly Shores in 2006 published a very uh, nice study looking at men at the VA and what she found was that those men with lower testosterone levels 
were much more likely to suffer from uh, earlier death. Uh, they died earlier or sooner than men with normal testosterone levels. And if you look at the studies following uh, the Molly Shore study, they were prospective studies, larger studies, all finding the same thing. Those men with lower testosterone levels uh, tended to have an increased mortality. And if you look at the right-hand column, the cause of death uh, seemed to be cardiovascular death in many of these studies. Uh, prior to 2010, there were also many studies suggesting that giving testosterone may decrease the risk factors for cardiovascular events. Risk factors meaning obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cholesterol. So again, uh, they may have some beneficial effect uh, in decreasing the risk factors for cardiovascular disease. We conducted our own review and we looked at every single article we could find from 1940 to 2014. We found over 200 articles addressing testosterone and cardiovascular disease, the majority of these studies being favorable. Again, suggesting that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular events. Um, and we could only find four studies suggesting that testosterone may increase cardiovascular risk. Now, these are the four studies. I don't have the time to go into each one of these in detail. Um, uh, the majority of these studies are not randomized or placebo controlled. Uh, and the Finkel study uh, did not even have a control group. Um, but suffice it to say that these studies did bring up some concern that testosterone may have an increased risk for cardiovascular events. Based on these uh, studies, um, the FDA did put in the package and certainly you should be aware uh, that uh, to date epidemiologic studies and randomized controlled trials have been inconclusive for determining the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events and patients should be informed of this possible risk when deciding whether to use or to continue the use of Anagel 1%. So this is in the package insert. Now the EMA, which is the equivalent of the FDA, did look at this data and have not made any changes to their cardiovascular warnings uh, of their products. But the uh, guidelines uh, are a little different. Now I will tell you that in 2018, we also published um, another study looking at all the studies from the FDA warning in 2015 to current date. And we found 23 studies also looking at testosterone and cardiovascular disease. And again, we couldn't find any studies suggesting that testosterone increases the risk of cardiovascular events. In fact, we found studies suggesting that men who normalize their testosterone with testosterone therapy uh, had a reduced risk of MI and death compared to those men whose testosterone failed to normalize. But the uh, AUA and endocrine guidelines do have statements on this. And the first statement by the AUA guidelines is very clear. Clinicians should inform testosterone deficient patients that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. That's important. Low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. Now, they go on to say, prior to initiating testosterone treatment, clinicians should counsel patients that at this time, it cannot be stated definitively whether testosterone therapy increases or decreases the risk of cardiovascular events. Now, if a patient does have a cardiovascular event, the AUA guidelines suggest that we wait at least three to six months before starting therapy again. The endocrine guidelines are a little different. The endocrine guidelines recommend that we wait six months, not three to six months, but six months. If a patient suffers from an MI, uh, we should wait at least six months. But the endocrine guidelines also agree there's no conclusive evidence to support that testosterone supplementation is associated with the increased cardiovascular risk in hypogonadal men. The proposed mechanism, just so you know, uh, is uh, several, there's four theories, but the most common theory uh, is the belief that the elevated red blood cell count, also known as erythrocytosis, uh, could then lead to thrombosis, orthogenesis, and increased cardiovascular risk. That is the most common theory. We spent quite a bit of time uh, studying this. This is a study that we published uh, looking at patients. Remember that the injectables have the highest rate of erythrocytosis. In our study, it was 66%. In other studies, it's about 40%. So if a patient starts developing an elevated red blood cell count, one of the quickest things you can do is get them off the injectable and put them on a gel. Uh, a gel typically has a erythrocytosis rate anywhere from two. I've seen as high as 13, 14% but it's a lower rate because there's less of a spike that occurs with the gels. The injectables cause a spike, 
which increase the erythrocytosis rate. Now that erythrocytosis typically doesn't occur till about three to six months. So there's no point in checking the blood in two or three weeks. You have to give it some time. And the number you want to remember is 54. Uh, the uh, guidelines typically state that at 54, uh, you want to either have the patient uh, phlebotomize, which means donate blood, or you want to decrease the dosage, but we don't want it to get above 54. Dr. Kara, one question here. Sure. Okay. Sure. sure. So, so um, but has anybody actually published data on hematocrit uh, versus DVT risk? Um, and the reason I'm asking is the DVT reports to the FDA, uh, where did they also report the patient's hematocrit or you know, because I've, I've seen some references, very small from Dr. Gluick, uh, that he is linking into uh, their 2% of men that had genetic predisposition to DVT. But my question is, have we actually linked hematocrit? Some, some patients even, uh, you know, uh, speculate that estradiol, which I don't think is a factor in DVT. Um, sure. Yeah. So two points. One, there has never been a, a testosterone trial, a testosterone trial, showing that, there's an, that the elevation in the hematocrit on the testosterone trial was the cause of a DVT, right? So, so there's been anecdotal data on patients taking testosterone and getting a DVT, but there's not been a trial showing that the testosterone, which caused an elevation in hematocrit, led to a DVT. Majority of the data that comes from an elevation in hematocrit causing a DVT is from the polycythemia vera data. Also, the vera is a malignancy of the bone marrow. And there has been several studies showing that an elevation in uh, hematocrit in this population may lead to an increase in DVT. Some were studies were inconclusive. Some studies did suggest that, yes, in this population, an elevation in hematocrit did lead to a DVT. But we should be clear that the polycythemia vera population is very different from the general population, right? And so it's really using a transference. You're just insinuating that this population and this data can be used in the general population. So again, I think you should be very careful. We, we need a trial. We need a large randomized placebo-controlled trial giving testosterone, looking at hematocrits in order to really assess uh, if it's really the hematocrit causing the DVT. All right. One important point I, I do wanna make is that if you look at the risk factors for low testosterone and you look at the risk factors for men who have cardiovascular disease, they're the same risk factors. Right, so it's obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, hyperglycemia, insulin resistance. These are the same risk factors. So it's not surprising that many men who are hypogonadal, whether they take testosterone or not, are at an increased risk for having a cardiovascular event because they share the same risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Okay. But we should also be clear. Yes, Nelson. No, no, go ahead, thank you. We should also be clear on the indications for testosterone therapy. Who is, who, is, who is it indicated for? So you should be aware that the FDA and their androgen class labeling guidelines in 1981 had a statement. Uh, androgens are indicated for the replacement therapy in conditions associated with a deficiency or absence of endogenous testosterone. This is the indication. Then they go on to list primary hypogonadism and secondary hypogonadism. And they do have the word idiopathic. So if a patient, now I don't believe that these conditions are meant to be exhaustive. There are other conditions that could cause primary or secondary hypogonadism. But if you have a patient that does not have a medical condition that leads, that is associated with hypogonadism, in other words, in my opinion, they're considered idiopathic, right? They have low T, signs and symptoms, but they don't have a condition listed on this list. So, but the FDA, uh, did, you should be aware, had a change and they made a statement in 2015 uh, that cautions that prescription testosterone products are approved only for men who have low testosterone levels caused by a certain medical condition. And the benefit and safety of these medications has not been established for the treatment of low testosterone levels due to aging, even if a man's symptoms seem related to low testosterone. And so I think that's very important because if you look at the new FDA guidelines after 2015, this is very similar to the uh, slide I showed you earlier, uh, with listing those conditions. The key difference is that the word idiopathic has been removed. So that no longer exists. So the FDA uh, is very clear that patients should have a medical condition listed on this um, uh, slide here uh, to be considered 
um, uh, hypogonadal. Again, I don't think this list is exhaustive, um, but this is uh, what we call the indications for therapy. Now realize this was a very nice study by Dr. Corona, looking at roughly 4,000 men who came to his clinic. And he found that uh, roughly 20% of men had hypogonadism. But the majority of hypogonadism is secondary hypogonadism, so, uh, roughly 85%. Of that 85% of men who have secondary hypogonadism, only 11% of them have a true medical condition or specific condition. 89% of them is due to an unknown cause. And if you look carefully at that unknown cause, um, roughly 70% of those men who are unknown uh, have actually one of three conditions. It's either diabetes, obesity, or metabolic syndrome. So uh, many of us believe that, that those are conditions, particularly obesity, should be considered a true medical condition associated with low testosterone. But again, um, it, it doesn't fit the list that currently is uh, that lists uh, those conditions such as pituitary tumor. So again, uh, majority of the patients don't have a medical condition listed uh, on the list of conditions associated with hypogonadism. We believe that those men that don't have a, a medical condition but still have signs and symptoms of hypogonadism um, and low testosterone values uh, also are benefiting from testosterone. In other words, men who have low testosterone due to a pituitary tumor or men who have low testosterone just simply because their testosterone is low um, and they suffer from the condition uh, should not be treated differently. They both will benefit uh, from testosterone therapy. And so we call these patients adult onset hypogonadism. Now remember a very important thing. Um, men don't lose a significant amount of testosterone as they age, aging alone. They typically acquire medical conditions such as diabetes, obesity, metabolic syndrome, that drop their testosterone uh, below a threshold of 300. But aging alone, majority of time, should, majority should not drop a man's testosterone level uh, below 300. It is the acquisition of medical conditions as we get older that will drop the testosterone, obesity, diabetes, metabolic syndrome. So again, this is, uh, this is illustrating the point. These are two studies by Travison and Handelsman. The red bar is the cutoff of low testosterone. And if you look even at the first study by Travison, uh, even up to 85 years of age, the majority of men, healthy men, do not have a decline in their testosterone below 300 due to aging alone. If you look at the study by Handelsman as well, if you look at the 50th percentile, uh, even up to 100 years of age, that's when they start seeing a slight decline. Um, and so again, Aging alone should not cause a significant decline in, in testosterone. It's really the acquisition of comorbid conditions. No, Dr. Kara, uh, Dr. a question here yes. on the previous slide. You know, when we talk, and I get this question a lot, we, get, we talk a lot about total testosterone, testosterone, testosterone. We really do not address the free testosterone. There's actually very few studies that have even looked at free testosterone. But doesn't free testosterone decrease with, with aging somehow? Is sex hormone binding globulin increasing? That's or is that all related to a great point. Such a great point, and that is true. We do know that the total testosterone does not signif decline significantly as we age. But we do know that SHBG does go up as men age. That is true. And that rise in SHBG is, is greater than the decline we see in total testosterone. And so your point is very valid. The net effect is that we do see a significant decline in free testosterone, uh, more so than we see in total. And remember that the body is much more sensitive to the free testosterone levels than the total testosterone levels. And so many of these patients who have normal, uh, as they get older, particularly as they get older, who have normal testosterone levels, let's say in the late three, uh, 350 or 380, if you check the free testosterone, SHBG, you'll find that actually it's low. Uh, and that's because, remember, as we get older, the SHBG goes up much more rapidly. So you're correct. Uh, the free testosterone does go down more as we age. Yeah. And so, some guys actually ask me, why don't we have guidelines that specifically state the range of free testosterone instead? But my answer is because we don't have enough data about what yeah. is normal free testosterone, right? Or Right. Well, there is, there, there is data uh, looking at free testosterone ranges. But, but look, if you look at the, even these slides I'm showing you here, and you look at the total testosterone in men between 50 and even 70 in the Travison study, or even between 60 and 70 in the Anelsman study, we don't see a significant decline on total. 
we were taught in the old days, you know, the total testosterone goes down, the andropause concept, it's not necessarily true. Healthy men should not have a significant decline in their total testosterone levels. But when these healthy men develop obesity, which will plummet the T, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, uh, opioid use, right, uh, uh, prednisone use, uh, HIV will drop it. These are certain conditions you will require that will drop it down. So yes, you acquire them as you get older, but it's not the aging, it's the acquisition of those conditions. But your, your point on free testosterone is very valid. So what do the guidelines say? The guidelines say a little bit different. The guidelines say that you must have a total test, a low testosterone level, and they want you to have two morning testosterone values and signs and symptoms. Both the endocrine guidelines and the AUA guidelines both say signs and symptoms and a low testosterone on two accounts. They are not saying that you have to have a medical condition listed uh, in order to be a candidate for testosterone therapy. So it's slightly, slightly different. So remember, as I mentioned earlier, it's low total testosterone. The number that most of the country uses is 300 nanogram per deciliter. And also they use uh, uh, signs and symptoms, right? So the laboratory value, the problem with this is that some um, uh, guidelines state that you should use the lab's reference range. In other words, you should use the, if the lab's reference range is 280 to 900, the number is 280. If the lab's reference range is 190 to 800, if the number is 190. But there's a problem with this, and this is nicely illustrated in this study I'm showing you here, where Dr. Morgenthaler's group called up 25 labs and said, could you please give me your lower reference range? And what they found was that the lower reference range was anywhere from 130 to 450 nanogram per deciliter. So let me give you an example. If a patient walks in and their testosterone level is 190, according to that lab, if it ranges 130 to 800, he's considered normal by those guidelines. And so uh, it's a little concerning because we all know that 190 is low. Uh, some insurance companies have also adopted these labs reference ranges as, a, as the lower limit as the cutoff. So I've had a patient before that came in and the lab reference range for his lab, I believe was uh, 190 to 800. And I think he came in with a lab of 210, which I know is low and you symptomatic. I prescribed the testosterone product and uh, the insurance company said, I'm sorry, but according to this, he's considered normal. And because the range is 190 to 800 and he's 210. And so again, I, there is concerns with using the lab's lower reference range because many patients who are truly hypogonadal uh, cannot even get therapy covered because of these regulations. Yeah, I want to add something to this too. That, you know, and I see that uh, 290, you know, I see it in the 300 range. You know, some guys are emailing me about, you know, they have 300, 280, 290, yes, and, and obviously all the symptoms, and uh, they get declined for, uh, for coverage on the insurance. But, um, you know, I remind people we have other ways to get testosterone with a prescription, and that's through compounding pharmacies. Sure actually make the product at a cheaper price that even out of pocket cash price is even as low as a copay. So um, believe it or not, because you're a great doctor and you obviously are an expert in the field, but many doctors don't tell the patient that gets declined by insurance that there is that option. And the patient basically just walks away and without treatment. Right. You know? Yeah, it's really important that we let them know that there are, are other options. You're absolutely correct. Um, you know, if a patient cannot get uh, a medication from insurance, you can get it uh, from a compounding pharmacy, um, and uh, if they, if it, which is much more affordable for them. And that's one of the huge benefits of having compounding pharmacies is that patients can afford their medications, which makes a big, big difference. You're absolutely correct. Um, so I, this is just illustrating the point again that if 300 nanogram per deciliter is the cutoff. I just want to make my own comment here. I don't believe that we have to have one number for everybody. It doesn't make sense. What you're saying is that at 290, everybody must feel bad, and at 310, everyone must feel good. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Uh, we showed also at Baylor, we, we took the blood from many patients who uh, came in as patients, and we looked at their DNA. And we looked at something called the CAG repeat, which is the sensitivity of the androgen receptor. And we showed that many patients who have very insensitive androgen receptors need more testosterone to feel better. And we showed that many patients who have very sensitive receptors don't need as much testosterone. Because we've all seen this. We have seen patients come in at, to some, at 250 and feel fantastic, 
And we've seen some patients come in at 450 and feel lousy, right? So everybody has their own threshold and it's hard to use one threshold for everybody. There has to be some leeway here. And other factors like thyroid too, you know, I mean, and some doctors don't even check thyroid function. Thyroid is very important. And then there's other factors too that are not hormonal, which we'll get into. But the reality is look at the symptoms. I mean, maybe they're depressed because it's ED, low libido, um, increased weight gain, decreased muscle mass, depression. Um, So depression, hyperthyroid, Um, you know, even the simple things like uh, weight, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress. So uh, uh, in poor diet, poor exercise, uh, not sleeping at night, um, and increasing your stress can be very similar to the signs and symptoms of hypogonadism, right? And so we always question, I call that the four pillars, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress. We want to make sure that, you know, if we start therapy, that you also meet me halfway and you be accountable for the diet and exercise, sleep, and stress. Two things that always come up, Nelson, are prostate cancer and BPH. Patients that say, I Googled it and I heard I can get prostate cancer. And so you really want to know where does that data come from? If you look at the first point uh, on the warnings and precaution uh, under BPH, it says patients with BPH treated with androgens are at an increased risk for worsening of signs and symptoms of BPH. Monitor patients with BPH for worsening signs and symptoms. So I want to be clear, there's not a single study Uh, that shows that men taking androgens have a worsening of their BPH symptoms. In fact, majority of the studies show that there's no effect or there's improvement in overall uh, urinary symptoms over long-term therapy. Um, And then it also says that you shouldn't treat men uh, with the history of breast cancer or prostate cancer as well. So I just want to show you some of that data. The guidelines are very clear, and I'm so glad that the AUA finally put out this statement because Until then, we didn't have a statement like this, but the first statement says, clinicians should inform patients of the absence of evidence linking testosterone therapy to the development of prostate cancer, period. Strong recommendation, grade B. So finally, there's a statement by the American Neurological Association making it very clear that those men uh, should be informed that testosterone does not increase the risk of developing prostate cancer. Now, the AUA also goes on to say, that if a man has a history of prostate cancer, radical prostatectomy, radiation, uh, we should inform them that we still don't have enough evidence to support the risk and benefit ratio of testosterone therapy in that population. But again, these are important statements. We know that testosterone is very important in stimulating nitric oxide and nitric oxide synthase within the bladder and the prostate. Why is that important? Because nitric oxide, nitric oxide synthase is very important keeping the bladder uh, healthy, uh, helping contractile ability, uh, also within the urethra as well. So when you go back, when you lose testosterone and you decrease nitric oxide, nitric oxide synthase, it's the belief that that can make um, urinary symptoms worse. That's one of the main theories between between BPH, testosterone, uh, and that's the link. Now, if you look at one of the earlier studies by Shigeru in 2011, Uh, They showed 52 men with BPH, lower urinary tract symptoms. They were receiving testosterone every week uh, for four weeks, excuse me, every four weeks compared to a control group. Those men that received testosterone had an improvement in urinary symptoms, mean flow rate, and voided volumes at the end of 12 months, not a worsening. A very nice study by Hader's group in 2009 also showed the same thing, that those men receiving testosterone over long term had an improvement in urinary symptom scores. Um, And the C-reactive protein also went down, suggesting that this is an anti-inflammatory effect, testosterone on the prostate. By far, this is the best review article that I've seen on testosterone and BPH. Um, It's by DeLay and Kohler, and they went through every article they could find on testosterone and uh, causing worsening of lower urinary tract symptoms. And what they found was that either there was no worsening of lower urinary tract symptoms at all, or an improvement in lower urinary tract symptoms over long-term therapy. So again, it's important that we know the data. If you ask men throughout the world, what's your number one reason why you don't take testosterone? If you ask clinicians, what's the number one reason why you don't prescribe testosterone? If you look at every country, it's predominantly, I'm scared of giving this patient prostate cancer. That is the concern. This started in 1941 by Huggins and Hodges. Uh, where they showed in a seminal paper that reducing testosterone to castrate levels caused prostate cancer to regress. 
In that same paper, they showed that the administration of exogenous testosterone caused prostate cancer to grow. If you pull that article, you'll find something very interesting. It's based on one single patient, 1941. One single patient is where we got this concern. One of the most amazing studies I've seen is by Lenny Marks, and this illustrates the prostate saturation model. He did a very interesting study. It was a randomized, double-blinded, placebo-controlled trial, 44 men. You had to have low testosterone and symptoms to enter the trial, and they received testosterone injections every two weeks. But they did something very interesting. They biopsied these patients' prostates before and six months after starting therapy. And what do they find? In, if you look at the blood, those men who received testosterone had an increase in their serum testosterone and their DHT levels. That's what you'd expect. You didn't see any change whatsoever in the placebo arm. How about in the prostate? This is very important. Absolutely no change at all in serum testosterone or DHT, excuse me, prostate testosterone or DHT, suggesting that the prostate acts like a sponge. It takes up all the testosterone that it wants and then it doesn't care how high you raise the testosterone, it's finished. So I'll show you some examples. This is the prostate saturation model. And let's say, for example, that a man walks in with a testosterone of 250. If you raise the testosterone, and that's the x-axis, you don't see any change in PSA or prostate growth based on this model. If you give this man Lupron, a medication that shuts down the testosterone, you will see the PSA go all the way down. This is called the prostate saturation model. Many of us, including myself, believe that the saturation is roughly around 250, roughly around 250. So this is an excellent example. This is Dr. Shelley Bassine's study where he gave testosterone at 600 milligrams uh, of testosterone or placebo for 10 weeks. What did he find? Even when you raise testosterone levels almost up to 2,500, if you look at the orange line, there's no change in PSA whatsoever. This is called uh, the testosterone flare. We were taught in residency, if you give a Lupron, which is uh, LHRH agonist, you will see a significant increase in serum testosterone, and that's the white bar, but you can see that there's no change in PSA, the yellow bar. But as the testosterone starts to come down, you see a decrease in serum PSA, a very nice example of the prostate saturation model. This is a study that I conducted in 2011. I had 451 patients, um, and I divided them into two groups, those with low testosterone, less than 250, where we believe the saturation model, those above 250, and what did we find? Exactly what I'd expect. Those patients less than 250, when you put them on testosterone, their PSA increases when you give them testosterone. You see a correlation. Those patients above 250, we did not see a correlation between giving them testosterone and changes in PSA. And that change in PSA is roughly about 0.3 nanogram per deciliter, about 0.3 nanogram per deciliter. Here are some uh, many studies looking at uh, testosterone and prostate cancer risk. <clears throat> we were taught that high testosterone increases your risk for prostate cancer. That's what we were taught in medical school. But the literature actually shows the opposite. The literature shows that low testosterone may increase your risk for prostate cancer. This is high, higher prostate cancer incidence, uh, higher tumor burden, higher pathologic stage, higher Gleason score, higher risk of seminal and vesicle invasion, and higher positive surgical margins. The literature would suggest the opposite. There have been several studies looking at giving testosterone after radical prostatectomy. Two of these studies are mine. Initial studies suggest that there was no increased risk uh, in giving men testosterone after radical prostatectomy. Now, let's be careful. These are not randomized. These are not placebo control studies. These are observational retrospective studies. Um, but there's some hint that there uh, may not be an increased risk. Our last study that we conducted in 2013, we had 103 patients, and we did see an increase in PSA in four patients. And I want to show you this. This is the study. We had 103 hypogonadal men. We treated them with testosterone after radical prostatectomy. We had 49 eugonadal controls. We did something a little unconventional. We did treat some of these men who are high risk, meaning Gleason score eight or higher, positive surgical margins, positive nodes. We also had a control group. Uh, and uh, in that control group, 15 men were high risk, 34 were non-high risk. In the testosterone group, 77 men were not high risk, 26 were high risk. What did we find? Only patients that had a biochemical recurrence or recurrence of their prostate cancer were men who were in the high risk group. And typically, we saw this recurrence at 36 months. 
Uh, if you were being treated with testosterone, the recurrence rate was 15%, which I would argue is quite low after 36 months. And in the, um, uh, the control group, it was 53%, um, so it was significantly higher. If you look at all the patients that have been treated with testosterone after prostate cancer, whether it be radiation, brachytherapy, the literature would support that their recurrence rate seems to be lower. Now, some would argue that this is a, a selection bias. Maybe you're selecting patients that are, are less at risk, uh, although in the study I just showed you, we did treat high-risk patients. But again, it seems that the patients treated after radical prostatectomy with testosterone may, and again, I don't have a randomized placebo-controlled trial, but may have a lower recurrence rate. And some would say, it, are you suggesting that it may be protective? Well, there is some basic science data to suggest that testosterone itself may cause prostate cancer cells to regress or not grow. And there may be some protective benefit. There's a very interesting uh, study going on at John Hopkins right now by Dr. Den Mead, um, who has done some amazing work with testosterone and prostate cancer. Uh, this is one of his first studies um, looking at 14 men with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And he gives them high doses of testosterone, 400 milligrams IM every three months. At the same time, he gives them Lupron. So we call this BAT for bipolar androgen therapy. High doses of testosterone, then it comes down. What did he find? And again, these are men with metastatic prostate cancer. He found a 50% reduction in PSA with giving them testosterone as therapy. And 50% of these patients had a radiographic response, improvement on metastatic disease. This study would have been unheard of 10 years ago, but to treat men with metastatic prostate cancer with testosterone is a completely different uh, paradigm shift in the way we think about testosterone and prostate cancer. This was his second study, 29 asymptomatic men uh, who had a, a low metastatic burden, so they had metastatic prostate cancer, or they had a biochemical recurrence, the so prostate cancer had returned based on the PSA. Again, he used bipolar androgen therapy uh, in these patients for three months, and almost 60% of these patients had a very low PSA, less than four, after the end of 18 months, which was his endpoint. And what did you expect? Many of these men reported an improvement in their quality of life, they reported the improvement in their erections, this is, again, this study would have been unheard of 10 years ago, but again, to think that we're, some men are using testosterone to treat metastatic prostate cancer uh, is very, very novel and interesting. This is coming from my lab. So in my lab, we do a lot of basic science work looking at testosterone. We took Petri dishes. Each Petri dish uh, was filled with prostate cancer cells, and we put different degrees of, uh, of uh, or different amounts of testosterone in each one of these Petri dishes. So at low levels of testosterone, you can look at the very dark gray bar, um, that you can see that there may be um, not much growth. And as you add uh, testosterone to these Petri dishes, yes, there is more growth of these prostate cancer cells. But as you get higher and higher doses of testosterone, you see greater and greater degrees of suppression of prostate cancer cell growth. And so I call this the inverted U, where castrate may be beneficial, euganadal may be beneficial, but the hypogonadal range may be the danger zone. And this is what we saw in our lab. These are, again, prostate cancer cells. Uh, letter A on top is uh, with no testosterone. Letter B is when we start adding testosterone. And letter C is with high doses or higher doses of testosterone where you see the suppression. Again, illustrating the inverted U. Uh, we did in the past uh, start a randomized placebo-controlled trial of giving testosterone to men after radical prostatectomy. Uh, we work with the FDA on this, uh, and what we were able to do is treat men as early as three months uh, with testosterone, but they had to have two undetectable PSAs, um, and we couldn't treat anyone higher than a Gleason 3 plus 4 was the highest we could treat. Just a word that many men will uh, receive uh, testosterone, will have a biochemical recurrence, and they should be counseled appropriately. And I do tell them and speak to them about the guidelines, uh, letting them know that, you know, with the history of radical prostatectomy, uh, uh, the risk-benefit ratio has not been uh, defined because we don't have, in all fairness, we don't have a randomized placebo-controlled trial as of yet looking at men after radical prostatectomy um, receiving testosterone. I just want to make a comment about occult prostate cancer because there's a movement in the United States on this concept of active surveillance. Active surveillance means that many men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer and we will follow them. Uh, and we will cautiously follow them over time. Well, some of these men will say, look, I have low testosterone. 
I'm on active surveillance. I want my testosterone back. And how do you respond and what does the literature show? One of the first studies was ours in 2011 where we took 13 men who were on active surveillance uh, who had been on testosterone, who had received testosterone therapy for a minimum of six months. Uh, they had majority were Gleason 3 plus 3. We had one patient who was a Gleason 3 plus 4. And the mean duration of testosterone therapy after the diagnosis of prostate cancer was roughly two years. So what did we find? We found no change in the PSA. We found no change in prostate volume. Uh, there was no cancer progression in any of these individuals. And when we re-biopsied these patients, 54% of them uh, did not have cancer on the biopsy. So again, you know, there are patients that will receive testosterone and active surveillance. Again, we do not have a randomized placebo-controlled trial as of yet, um, but there is some data out there. There are several other studies besides this one um, also looking at testosterone in active surveillance population. And none before, of see, uh, I'm sorry, before we proceed, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, this, these patients, um, are they treated with higher doses or just a regular uh, TRT dose? This is a different, yeah, this is a, a different population of the population of men that we showed you with Dr. Den Mead's study. Dr. Den Mead's study was men with castrate resistant prostate cancer, which is or metastatic disease or a biochemical recurrence. These patients are on active surveillance and they are, uh, have low testosterone and are just being put back into the normal range. Now, let's think about something for a second. We know that one in six men, one in six men have occult prostate cancer. There's no question. They're walking around that they just don't know. And when you treat 60 men in your practice, I promise you, you're giving 10 men with active prostate cancer testosterone. You just don't know it. You just don't know it. But they have occult prostate cancer. And there's not been a single study to show that those men being treated with testosterone have a higher rate of developing prostate cancer than those men not being treated with testosterone. And so again, I know when I'm treating many of these men with testosterone that have potentially have occult prostate cancer, but they're not lighting up, right? And so it's very similar to what you're seeing in this study that I showed you prior of men who are receiving testosterone on active surveillance. I, I do want to urge some caution here. I mean, there's been no randomized, no placebo controlled trials. I'm just showing you some preliminary data. Um, and it's hard to say on these uh, small uh, studies uh, uh, to comment on safety. Um, and we do need a randomized placebo controlled trial to really help us illustrate the efficacy, really the safety of this, of, this, of this medication, this population. I also do believe that men who are hypogonadal are at a significant disadvantage in recovering their erectile function following radical prostatectomy. And uh, I do think that the window is the first six months. Um, and so I tell patients, you know, um, if they have low testosterone, two undetectable PSAs, um, I do think it's very important to consider testosterone therapy uh, early on to help recover their overall erectile function. And what is that period of time? And you said six months is probably the tops and... If it's the first six months is very important. Uh, you know, we know that the majority of recovery of erectile function is within the first year. You know, majority of uh, erectile... But to me, the first six months is extremely important. And that's why we spend a lot of time uh, undergoing a concept called penile rehabilitation and using medications to help increase the blood flow and the oxygen to the penile tissue, helping these men once again obtain their uh, uh, erections because you have to do it early on uh, because if you wait, we know that men develop venous leak. They're more likely to develop increased collagen fibrosis within the penile tissue if you just uh, stay dormant and watch. And so it's a proactive approach. And part of that proactive approach is also using testosterone therapy uh, to help with recovery of overall erectile function. I do want to comment on testosterone and fertility because it's important. Many clinicians do not know that testosterone is a natural contraceptive and it can significantly uh, decrease a man's sperm count. So many young men are not aware. And I'll see many men in my practice every month who come in that have started testosterone did that, that did not know or were not told that, that testosterone can significantly decrease their sperm count. You know, so look, how many men are we talking about in the reproductive years? We know that men in the reproductive years who are hypogonadal, uh, roughly three to 8% of the men between the ages of 20 and 45 uh, have a true instance of hypogonadism. Uh, and this translates into roughly 2.5 million men, so a significant amount of men. And some of these men will come to you, they have low testosterone and they'll say, look, I want to start testosterone, but I also want to have kids in the future. What do you do? 
Now, historically, you can use off-label uh, medications, and this is off-label, but clomiphene citrate has been used to help raise endogenous testosterone, and it doesn't lead to infertility. In other words, it doesn't shut a man's natural sperm count or testosterone down. Uh, you can use HCG if he truly is hypogonadal, HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin injections. HCG is just an LH analog, and that can be used to help improve a man's own natural testosterone production as well. We did conduct some novel studies in the past. Uh, this is actually a study by the WHO, which showed that if you give men 200 milligrams of testosterone a week, which many men are on 200 milligrams weekly, 65% uh, of them are azoospermic at six months. means sperm count is zero at six months. If you stop the testosterone, many of these men will recover, but they don't necessarily recover back to baseline. So when you look at the recovery, the most of the studies say, how many will recover greater than 20 million? An average man makes 80 million uh, sperm per ml. So most of the studies will tell you how many recover, but they won't tell you how many recover back to baseline. This study showed that only 46% of men uh, came back to baseline at roughly seven months. So again, men should be very cautious when they're using testosterone they want to conceive in the near future. So can we preserve fertility? Some men want to take exogenous testosterone and still preserve their fertility. And so there's some very interesting studies. And one of the most fascinating studies was the uh, Coviola study where he had 29 normal healthy males and he gave them testosterone 200 milligrams a week. And we just talked about the fact that if you give them 200 milligrams a week, they become azospermic at six months. But he also gave them HCG at zero, 125, 250, and 500 units every other day. Very interesting because he's hoping that he give the HCG to preserve the internal access while you're still giving exogenous testosterone. And he measured intratesticular testosterone at day zero and 21. So let's see what he found. So if you look, this is where testosterone was given at baseline. And you can see at the orange bar is the baseline intratesticular testosterone at day 21, the intratesticular testosterone. And exactly what you'd expect, you give someone high doses of testosterone, you shut down their own natural production of testosterone production. That's what you'd see. But when you start giving low doses of HCG, what you see is you start preserving intratesticular testosterone at the same time that you're giving exogenous testosterone, right? Very interesting. So you're not shutting down. So this is the reason why many of uh, clinicians use HCG to preserve testicular atrophy. Right? Because what it does is it continues to produce your own natural testosterone to some degree without shutting down uh, those cells. And that does help with atrophy and it does help with producing your own natural testosterone. So at Baylor, uh, we looked at extrapolating that data and saying, okay, if it's true, can you also preserve someone's fertility by giving them HCG? And this is a study looking at 26 men treated with daily testosterone gel or weekly testosterone injections. They received HCG 500 every other day, and the follow-up was six months. And what they find is, again, six months, you see a very slight decline in uh, spermatogenesis from 35 million to 30 million after six months of giving them HCG plus testosterone. Now, I, this is an older study. It was in 2013. I've continued to do this. I just want to give a word of caution that there are some men, even if you give them HCG 500 every other day, they will see a significant decline. Uh, in the sperm production. So not all men uh, will have just a slight uh, decline. Some will have a much more significant decline. But it's, it's a way of preserving testicular volume and possibly preserving fertility in some of these men. Yeah, let's, um, a question here. Yeah, it seems like I reviewed the data that um, you and Dr. Lipschultz's group um, created on this. Seems like the older you are, the longer you have been on testosterone they lower the response. Um, releasing that is absolutely correct, and that is true. It's depending on age, uh, uh, ethnicity. We know also that if you, how long you've been on the medication and the dose, right? So the, that all impacts uh, this um, uh, uh, recovery. And uh, remember that um, the, one of the most important things is many of these patients have been on very high doses for many years. And at that time, it's very difficult to recover their access. Now, yeah. we have a protocol. Uh, the protocol is we stop the testosterone and we put them on high doses of ACG, uh, 3,000, uh, three times a week. And many patients can see recovery spermatogenesis, but it can take about seven months. So I tell many of these patients, when if you're thinking about conceiving, I need a runway of about seven months 
uh, before, you know, so I, you let me know so I can make the switch. So have you ever used Clomid, uh, Clomiphene with HCG or is that a no-no? I do, uh, I do. And actually I do it quite a bit if they're trying to recover their uh, fertility because Clomiphene citrate will help increase the FSH uh, while HCG will increase the LH. Now, I would prefer to use gonal F, which is recombinant FSH, uh, but it's very expensive. So what I use is I use Clomid instead of gonal F as a substitute because it's much cheaper. But if I, you can also use compounded uh, FSH. Let's go to the previous, I'm sorry, the previous slide, if you don't mind. Um, sure. Yeah, that one. You know, I've also reviewed this data. I wrote a long article. I have a, a few videos on HCG myself, become like the HCG advocate. And what most doctors and patients, I'm not only saying patients, do not understand is that this thing, the intratesticular testosterone, the testosterone inside the testicles, is not equal to the testosterone in the blood. Yes. And they also, they don't understand that once you shut down LH and FSH, ITT goes down, even if your testosterone in your blood is 700. So could you, could you tell us a little bit about that? Because it seems it's like all, I'm, I'm failing right. on, that, on, that, on that explanation for some right. reason. So the key really is the access. Remember that what is the fuel to the testicle? The fuel to the testicle is the pituitary, the LH, right? So if you shut off the LH, you will decrease the testicular production of testosterone, no question. And so what does exogenous testosterone do? Exogenous testosterone goes back to the brain and shuts down LH secretion, right? And that shutdown LH secretion not, will decrease intratesticular testosterone production, but even though your T levels are 700 because you're taking exogenous testosterone, right? So your exogenous testosterone will look great, LH and FSH are suppressed, and intratesticular testosterone goes down. And that's the mechanism. So I want to make one comment, and this is very important. If you look at diseases in the United States, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, you go to your primary care physician, we don't, they don't start treating you with a pill. In America, we try to do disease modification before we give you the pill. And the question is, is testosterone and hypogonadism any different? Are there things that we can do to improve the testosterone level without using testosterone therapy or using medications to raise endogenous testosterone? Um, and should we consider them first or not? Um, and I want to show you some things that you can do. I definitely have some patients in my practice that say, doctor, I do not want to take any medication. I just want you to show me natural ways that I can raise my serum testosterone level. And I do tell them that there's four things you want to remember, and we talked about this earlier, diet, exercise, sleep, and stress reduction can all raise your natural testosterone value as well. So let me just show you some interesting slides. So there are natural ways, diet and exercise, improving insulin resistance, weight loss, stress reduction, sleep, varicocele repair has also been shown to raise natural testosterone levels. This is one of the earlier studies uh, looking at lifestyle modification. These are 44 obese men that were put on a 12-week uh, exercise and diet program. Uh, they had a significant improvement in systolic blood pressure, and they also had a significant improvement in their serum testosterone values. But this, this improvement was very mild, 25 nanogram per deciliter. Although it was statistically significant, in many opinion, is not clinically significant when they increase. There's another study by Hugh Felder, 52 week randomized trial. These are 32 men with diabetes metabolic syndrome. 16 were able to do diet and exercise. 16 had diet, exercise, plus testosterone. Diet, exercise alone significantly improved serum testosterone values. That is true. Even up to, but the key thing here is that when you add testosterone to diet and exercise, it is even that much greater in terms of weight loss uh, as well. Now, this is my favorite study on obesity and testosterone. It's the Camacho study, and it really comes from the European Male Aging Study where they had almost 2,700 patients that were falling longitudinally. And if you look, if you look, just a 10% decrease in weight, it increased your serum testosterone by 85 nanogram per deciliter. But remember, the opposite is also true. A 10% increase in weight decreases your testosterone by 85 nanogram per deciliter. There's a bimodal direction, we call it. But look at the line. It's not straight. It's curvy linear. So if you lose... 15% of your body weight, uh, you can almost see 180 nanogram per deciliter increase in your serum testosterone. But if you 
and, and the vice versa increases as well. So again, uh, I tell patients, if you can lose weight and keep it off, you actually will see a significant improvement. And let me show you a great example. It comes from the bariatric, liter bariatric literature where we do weight loss surgery, right? So in this study, it's a meta-analysis of 22 studies and a mean percent weight, uh, weight loss was 10% on a low calorie diet, but you lose 32% uh, uh, of your weight by bariatric surgery. What happens on low calorie diet? 83 nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone. That's great, 83% uh, in nanogram per deciliter. But in patients who have bariatric surgery, 250 nanogram per deciliter increase in testosterone. That is not only statistically significant, but it's clinically significant. If a guy comes in at 250 and you put him uh, at, you know, basically at 500, that means something just by losing weight. So sleep is also very important. So we don't realize this, but we make testosterone when we sleep. That's why our highest levels of testosterone are in the morning, right? Because we make it while we sleep. If you're not sleeping, it can be an issue. Uh, this is uh, looking at men with sleep apnea. They have a higher prevalence of uh, hypogonadism because remember, when you're sleep apnea, you are hypoxic. You don't have oxygen in the brain. When the oxygen goes down, it decreases the LH and FSH secretion in the, in the pituitary. Um, but this is looking at studies uh, doing what we call UPP surgery, which is fixing the sleep apnea. Within three months, you'll see almost 100 nanogram per deciliter increase in serum testosterone just by improving sleep apnea. But sleep deprivation is very interesting. So if you restrict the sleep for eight nights, if you restrict your sleep for eight nights on only five hours every night, you will see almost a 15% reduction in your serum testosterone. That's a lot. 15% reduction just by restricting your sleep. And the important part of the sleep is actually not 12 to 4 a.m., but it's 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Because when sleep is restricted during the first half of the night and you're allowed to sleep from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m., no change in serum testosterone. So the second half of the night is more important than the first half of the night when it comes to serum testosterone values. Hmm. Stress is a killer. Uh, remember that stress increases cortisol. You see actually true physiologic changes in the body, uh, ha shallow uh, breathing, increased rapid heart rate, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, decreased immunity. Many changes occur. Uh, this is just an example looking at medical students and residents, and I don't know if this really illustrates the point well, but the point is that when you look at internal medicine residents uh, and you look at their testosterone values compared to other hospital personnel, the residents tend to have very low uh, serum testosterone. It may be due to stress, maybe also due to lack of sleep, but it's about 250 nanogram per deciliter. And these are typically younger patients, which should theoretically you know, maybe have slightly higher testosterone values. Andy Gay did a wonderful study looking at what are the significant factors associated with hypogonadism, and there were four, hypertension, tobacco use, sleep apnea, and work stress. Work stress was an independent predictor of those patients who were going to have lower testosterone values. Finally, varicocele repair, and uh, as, as many of you know, varicocele is a dilation of the blood vessels around the testicle, and that dilation uh, contains heat and pressure on the testicle puts the testicle under stress. And so many have looked at the use of repairing varicoceles to improve testosterone. And this is one study, it's a retrospective review of 53 patients. It was one of the earlier studies, it was done back in 1995, uh, showing that those patients who had a varicocele repair in this study had almost a 90 uh, nanogram per deciliter improvement uh, in serum testosterone values. After this study, there were many uh, other studies. It was a prospective study and a meta-analysis. What did they find as well? If you fix the varicocele, you can see anywhere from an 80 to 100 nanogram deciliter improvement in serum testosterone values just by fixing the varicocele. Before I go any further, and these are my last two slides, I just want to illustrate the point that there could be some benefit in lifestyle modification. For example, if you lose a significant amount of weight, if you fix the varicocele, if you fix the sleep apnea, if you add, take it additively, 100 hair, 200 hair, 100 hair, it could be significant. Lifestyle modification could significantly raise those serum testosterone values where you may not need serum testosterone. In the future, there are some technologies. We uh, wor worked on some technology which we patented uh, in the past called nanotechnology. It's like a chip, and basically this chip is implanted underneath the side of the hip. Uh, this chip will then release testosterone like an hourglass. It's consistent. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner, uh, the red line is what you see with testosterone pellets, injectables, you get a surge, 
and then in four months it comes down. But theoretically with nanotechnology, it's a slow even release uh, over the four month period that you can see with the green line. And then also this concept of stem cells. So Dr. Uh, Ranjit Ramaswamy, he was a fellow here at Baylor, did some amazing work looking at Leydig stem cells, basically taking stem cells. So remember, the stem cells can turn into any cell in the body. He's taking stem cells that will then be injected into the testicle and those stem cells now start producing a man's own testosterone again. So instead of giving him testosterone, he's now producing his own testosterone, which is fascinating work. So in conclusion, uh, the diagnosis of hypogonadism can be challenging, with many men being treated off-label. Clinicians prescribing testosterone therapy should be aware of the 2018 AUA and endocrine guidelines and also the recent FDA label changes. Testosterone therapy has been shown to improve BPH and lower urinary tract symptoms. Uh, serum testosterone has been associated with an increased risk of MI and cardiovascular risk factors. To date, there's no convincing data to support that testosterone therapy causes prostate cancer. And I do believe that patients should be appropriately counseled on the risk of VTE, CVE, BPH, and prostate cancer when prescribing testosterone therapy. And thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kara. I mean, uh, this is one of the best uh, lectures I've seen. I, I just love the not only you're a clinician that treats patients, but also spend a lot of time on research. I have only two questions, um, sure. and they're actually not really related to the content you presented, but it's more side effect management, uh, because I get this question a lot. Uh, when it comes to edema and um, estradiol management and edema, two different separate subjects, um, what do you do when a patient presents with uh, either edema water retention in the, in, the, in the extremities, or even general wa water weight gain? So two things. Uh, first of all, I look at the source of testosterone that you're using. We know that cypionate is a little bit more anabolic and has a little bit more sodium retention. So if he's on cypionate, I will convert him from cypionate to anandate, right? That's important. Sometimes it's a dose effect. If the testosterone is too high, you may get too much edema as well. So you may want to lower the dose as well. I do look at estradiol, but estradiol is more important to me for two things. One, if it's too high, it's, I'm worried about gynecomastia, right? But it's interesting. In the old days, we used to give men a lot of aromatase inhibitors because we said estradiol is bad. We must decrease estradiol because more estradiol, the worse. And we'd shut them down. But that is not true. Actually, Finkelstein had a phenomenal article showing that actually many, many of the beneficial effects, even sexual effects of testosterone, are actually an estradiol effect. So you don't want to shut the estrogen down. You want to uh, keep it at a good level. Um, and you want to, uh, you, obviously I don't want it too high, but I don't want it zero either. My sweet spot has historically been between 30 and 60. You know, so I don't want it below 30, but I want it too much higher than 60. So I will use aromatase inhibitors to keep it between that range. But you don't use it in many patients. I mean, proportion, what are proportion of patients that are using it? Only who needs it, right? Yeah. Only who needs it. So I don't throw it on liberally on everyone without checking their estrogen. Remember, what's the conversion rate to estradiol? It's 0.3%. So of the testosterone that we give, 0.3% is converted to estrogen. And so based on his estrogen level, you can decide how much aromatase inhibitor to give. Uh, it's about managing it. So you look at the level, you start at one milligram a week, if you recheck it, it's still too high. You can give two milligrams a week, but manage it. And in the old days, we used to just give them one milligram a day or, and just not look at it. But that, that wasn't right because that had an adverse effect on libido. And bone. And bone. He's right. Long term. That's correct. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I'm sure you're going to get a lot of questions um, from this video. I'll be posting it on YouTube, excelmail.com, and other uh, networks like Facebook. So hopefully we'll have you back in uh, Thank you. a few months to answer some of those questions. And thanks a lot. Uh, how can people, um, you know, get get a hold of you or or get to see you as a doctor? Uh, do you see patients sure. from outside Houston? Absolutely. One of the easiest ways is to go to the Baylor website, www.bcm or Baylor College of Medicine.edu. Under the urology website, there's ways to see some of the work, some of the videos. Um, and, uh, and it's a great way to just get in touch with the program. All right. Thanks a lot, Dr. Kara. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, Nelson. Thank you. Bye-bye.